Killzone 3. Killzone 2 was an interesting game. Short, sweet, and very, very pretty. Can Killzone 3 do better? Well, no. No, it can't. It does have a split-screen two-player campaign mode, though. That's why I bought it anyhow. I don't really care about other forms of multiplayer. Maybe, maybe cross-console campaign mode. That's about it. One of the silliest complaints about Killzone 2 was that its controls were sluggish. We're not talking about input lag, though that was also a criticism. Isn't it amazing how many euphemisms there are for it's different? This isn't right, As a result, the developers have, the are you ready to groan? One one. Because we all know what I'm about to say and why it's bad, right? Listened to the fans. And by listen to the fans, I of course mean listen to its detractors who wanted a Call of Duty with prettier graphics. So the controls have been redone. Now, rather than the weapons having a good feeling of heft, like, well, guns, they now feel like toys, or in fact, the same toy. The uniqueness of each weapon is just gone. The rocket launcher handles much like the pistol. The sniper rifle, which actually required steady hands since any movement holding the pad affected your aim in Killzone 2, is now just like any other weapon, but with zoom. It actually suffers for being harder to use since of course you ended up using the motion detection to finish the aim of any particular shot. Killzone 2 also had a wonderful recoil system that really knocked your shots off course, forcing you to fire in short bursts if you wanted any accuracy over range. Importantly, this gave the enemy weapons a very different feel than your own. The enemy's weapons, the, the Hellgast, are very rapid firing and clearly designed for close quarters, going off target due to recoil quickly, whilst the ISAs, that's the good guys, are more versatile ranged affairs. No more in Killzone 3. Whilst the weapons do have different spreads, they're now pretty even in terms of recoil. Overall, the spray of the weapon is kept to a comparatively small area, no matter how long you stay in full auto. The games media will love it and call it tight. Don't you just love buzzwords? Unfortunately, the attempt to call of dutify the game didn't stop there. As the blurb inspiring review from Games Radar says, and I quote, it's as if every complaint critics levelled at Killzone 2 was taken into account and fixed, unquote. For the worse. The whole dynamic in how the game is played has also been affected. The wonderful thing about Killzone 2 was its non-stop intensity, and the feeling that the invasion of Helgan was very, very much an act of attrition, with each bloody footstep the ISA take towards the Helgan capital a monumental act of sheer will and determination. The Helgan soldiers were tough and took colossal amounts of damage to put down permanently, outside of headshots. But that's okay, because so did you. What Killzone isn't is your average fast-paced shooter, yet clearly thinks it is, judging from the number of deaths you'll deal with, due to being made of glass, and the ability of enemies to shoot you in cover. Not enough to make you respond quickly, like in other fast-paced shooters, unfortunately. In fact, it's now slower to respawn because Rico, or a second player, can revive you when they feel like it. Although it's all rather arbitrary whether or not your computer-controlled partner can. As a result, and despite other things which you'd think would make the game overly easy, like the conveniently spread out and not exploded infinite caches of ammunition for every weapon, it is actually tougher than Killzone 2, and shouldn't be. Doubly so when you read the descriptions for the difficulty levels. Looking at the player length, the game feels quite short. I didn't actually time myself, but even if it isn't actually shorter than Killzone 2, it certainly felt it. This is probably to do with Killzone 3's forgettable story and dialogue, unfortunately. I'm not going to spoil it in case you do eventually play the game, but where the ending is supposed to be a giant exclamation point at the end of a three-part story beginning with the first Killzone, it's over so quick you feel a bit... Was that it? Killzone 2 was about the ground battle to Vizari's palace after a failed air strategy was stopped dead by the Helgast's experimental Tesla-esque weaponry. It had the ISA forces and yourself moved, ever, ever onward to your target. It had a sensible yet still varied sequence of different locations to make it interesting. Killzone 3, on the other hand, simply adopts the Call of Duty trope of using the stock set of terrains for variety rather than the myriad or inspiring sequences with the massive trains and the unusual spaceships of Killzone 2, we get the usual parade of Arctic, Desert, Jungle. Helgan has those? There are bits that try to be different or more Killzone 2, but don't really work quite as well. 
The ship sequences in Killzone 3 feel too clean, whereas the junkyard sequences feel too messy, never finding that happy medium, always being too little, too much, but mostly just bland. Which is a terrible shame since the textures are very detailed and well drawn, surpassing those in Killzone 2. We'll talk about graphics more in a bit. The most blatant nod to the fans is the entire section of Killzone 3 that's lifted from Modern Warfare 2. Aren't these sort of games bizarrely homoerotic enough without the disturbing Big Brother relationships, a la Roach and Soap? Yet here again, Killzone 3 has an annoying habit to genericize itself to conform to Call of Duty tropes. There's an entire stealth section halfway through the game that is just the demo of Modern Warfare 2. The major difference is being it's jungle instead of tundra, and the other guy isn't Scottish and has more facial hair. The worst part is that I really enjoy stealth sections, and this was no exception, but I enjoyed it so much less due to the derivative and overdone nature of the sequence. The Big Brother thing continues throughout with Rico, but is at a far more tolerable level. In Killzone 2 you really felt like you were an equal member of Alpha Squad, or at least to Rico. Yes, Alpha Squad. That was cool, wasn't it? You don't really feel like a squad in Killzone 3, however, more like a lesser partner to Rico, who only outranks you very slightly, but he tells you to stay behind him and other similar suggestions, which you can of course dutifully ignore. It doesn't stop there though, unfortunately. You don't really feel like you're part of a larger ISA force either. I mean, you see them around and they'll occasionally run ahead of you and get killed pointlessly, but they never advance with you or fight alongside you like in Killzone 2. A rather unpleasant side effect of this is that it kind of makes the Hellgas look comically incompetent. In Killzone 2, with you fighting as part of a larger structure, you're the few good men who push the effort past the tipping point. In Killzone 3, you personally slaughter literally hundreds of Hellgas men, and you don't even feel particularly heroic for doing so. Of course, you kill hundreds in Killzone 2, but you get the impression the ISA and Hellgast would be at a standstill without you, and so it doesn't give you the impression of comic ineptness to the Hellgast force, and the ISA give you constant positive reinforcement to allow us to do what we do. The game is possibly even aware of this as several times in the dialogue it's touched upon. Nothing, nothing in Killzone 3 surpasses the feeling of taking Vizari Square with the backing of the ISA. It's such a shame too. It was great being credited for the method of heroically taking down heavies in Killzone 2. It's a great example of what I mean by the enemy seeming inept in Killzone 3 by comparison. In 2, the heavy is introduced as a metal encased monster armed to the teeth with high precision, extreme rapid fire ordnance, and calls out to you in a deep, threatening baritone. In 3, it's a silly tin man who can't hold his gun properly. What happened to the events of Killzone 2 anyway? Why are Rico and Seb not at each other's throats by this point? That was definitely the way that things were headed in Killzone 2's wonderful character development, but they just kind of make up in this one. Killzone 3 of course doesn't really have character development, it barely has any banter between the members of the ISA. You get ordered around a lot, that's about it, no development. Humanisation of the characters and forces has been replaced with an arbitrary six month gap. I kid you not. Thing is, Rico is actually less interesting in Killzone 3 anyway. You'll be thankful he's actually calmed down right until the realisation of just how much duller and less interesting he's become. Plus, I'm certain the kind of problematic psychoses Rico suffers from would not be solved by the period of time portrayed with no psychological help. What happened to the moral ambiguity as well? In 2, you start to get the impression that not only are the Hellgas not as bad as initially thought, we see their homes are not unlike our homes, and that you aren't really the good guys either. That rather than being motivated by justice and the pursuit of peace, you're motivated by base revenge. Or at least Rico is. It's like neither of you are good, but it is necessary to believe so to fight on. Not so in Killzone 3. You barely see evidence of the Hellgas civilization at all. It's all dusty battlegrounds or clinically clean installments. More than that, the Hellgas are cartoonishly evil. You know who totally shouldn't have died in Killzone 2? Scalar Vizari. Guerrilla Games evidently agree, and have him posthumously teaser the game in the opening cinematic. Having a voice actor who can convincingly mix Hitler and Churchill was a stroke of genius that doesn't play out as well in Killzone 3 due to a slight case of death. Instead, Vizari is replaced by two admittedly cool and interesting characters who were there to replace Radic and Vasari in Killzone 3. Mostly the problem is one of not getting to really interact with them. What I mean is, with Radic, 
well, you actually get to fight him, and he's a worthy opponent through various points in the game, even if you don't personally interact with him until the end fight. With Vasari, whilst you don't get to fight him, he's with you all the way through the game, his voice blaring propaganda through the capital city's loud hailer system, and of course you have that brilliant ending sequence with him. To contrast, in Killzone 3, we never even get to meet one of the villains. We seem to be interested in him purely because of his relationship to the other one, whom we get to very, very briefly meet, and that is spelled very early on by making it a how did we get here moment. I see that the private sector is interested in state affairs. Again. The ISA tank group on the left. I mean, are you ignoring it on purpose, or is this part of some strategy beyond our understanding? Sorry may have tolerated you, Stahl. But I am not for sorry. Hmm, unfortunately, that is abundantly clear. Does it hurt, hmm? Knowing that no matter what you do, you'll never emerge from Vissari's shadow. Is that why you let him die? Helgas will never... Never bargain with the ISA! There will be no quarter!